Um, so Pastor Mark, I was hoping that maybe you could just take a few minutes just to um, tell us a little bit about yourself personally, your um, you know, your, your kind of life story and uh, how you became obviously passionate about this work and, and, and sharing all of this with, uh, with people in our country. Well, hello, everybody. It's good to be with you. I'm glad that I have an opportunity to both preach at your church this morning, as well as to uh, have a chance to do this Q&A now after the service. Um, there's a lot of the story <laughs> that I could go off on. I've got entire seminars on kind of leading up to the writing of what I've been doing and the book I wrote and the sermon I preached. Um, a lot of my story is in this book on selling truth, and it shares a lot of kind of the journey I've had along the way. A few of the highlights of the journey is I was born at a mission hospital in uh, outside of right near Gallup, New Mexico, which is a border town to the Navajo Nation. My grandparents on my father's side, my Navajo grandparents were translators for some of the early missionaries. And my grandmother had become a Christian in the boarding schools, but the faith that she received was very much a colonized faith. Um, like I described, it's a faith that said, you know, to be Christian, you have to become an American. You have to give up your language, your culture, your, your understanding of your own worldview, and you have to become like um, a Western American. And so because of that, in, in their, my father's growing up years, he wasn't taught Navajo. They focused on English um, and uh, therefore he didn't know the language to teach it to me. And so I grew up not understanding my culture very well. And it wasn't until um, after college that I, I actually began to invest much more time into understanding my Navajo culture and my um, understanding of what it meant to kind of decolonize my faith. A big part of that journey was I was asked to pastor a church in Denver called the Christian Indian Center. And uh, it was a mission of the Christian from church to the, uh, maybe CJ, do you want to mute your mic for a moment? Or is someone not muted? I hear some, there we go. And so then, uh, I was asked to pastor a church in Denver called the, the Christian Indian Center. And it was on my first Sunday there, actually my first council meeting with the elders and deacons of the church. Um, we sat down and they informed me that their previous pastor had introduced them to the process of contextualizing worship. And they asked if I could lead the church more fully into that practice. I said, sure, that sounds great. How do you spell it? I had no clue what they were talking about. And they told me that there was a there was a um, a group that was meeting that summer actually in Hawaii called the World Christian Gathering on Indigenous Peoples, and it was Indigenous Christian leaders from all over the world who gathered together on a regular basis to share stories of how they were decolonizing their faith, not only in America but all throughout the world. Indigenous peoples had been colonized by the gospel; they were presented the gospel of Christ, but it was usually in a very colonial way that said to become Christian. You have to embrace Western culture, Western civilization, Western languages. And that's how a lot of indigenous peoples around the world were converted to Christianity. And so there was kind of a renaissance going on of people asking the question, what does it mean to be indigenous in my faith? How do I worship Christ using my own language, my own understanding of the sacred, my own regalia, and so on and so forth. And so I met with this group. This group met for probably six to eight years. And I met with them on a regular basis in different countries all around the world, um, sharing stories and learning about what people were doing to decolonize their faith. My participation in that group prompted me and my wife to move back to the Navajo Nation. And we moved there in, uh, it was probably 2003, I think it was. And, uh, we uh, lived for six years, we lived, or for three years, we lived in a very remote section of the Navajo Nation. We were six miles off the nearest paved road on a dirt road. We were in a community that had no running water, no electricity. Uh, our neighbors were rug weavers and shepherds. And uh, when we moved there, we, we intentionally chose to live there so we could experience the more traditional culture and lifestyle. Um, and we prepared ourselves to live off the grid. We prepared ourselves to haul water, to, to to live by candlelight, to, to cook over a camp stove or an open fire. But what caught us by surprise was how absolutely marginalized 
that community was, the entire reservation. One of the observations I made most quickly was that primarily the only group of non-natives who came to Indian reservations were those who came to take your picture and those who came to give you charity. And neither of those groups were interested in, in building a long-term peer-to-peer type relationship. So as we were experiencing that marginalization and as we were living on the reservation and witnessing and observing the historical trauma of our people that came from the boarding schools and from the removal, as I was learning more about the history, I found it was having a deep impact on me both emotionally and psychologically. I was growing in insecurity. I was, um, I was becoming more and more angry. And I was trying to process through some of those emotions with some friends of mine who I had known before we moved back to the reservation, mostly over the phone or even by email. And every time I would bring up the topic, it wasn't long until I could feel some of the emotions rising in me, some of the anger coming up in me, and I'd have to jump out of the conversation or shut it down so I wouldn't start yelling at my friends. So I kind of learned how to disconnect. And I trained myself to talk about it like I was... Um, it was something I read in the newspaper. That let me stay in the dialogues longer, but then the longer I was in the conversation, I saw the defense of my friends rise. It wasn't my family who did that to your people. It wasn't my community that did those things. And soon they would drop out of the conversation because they were so defensive and upset. And I could not find a way to have a real honest dialogue about these issues. And one day I was sitting down, I was writing a letter. It was maybe the 10th time I was trying to tell my friends how it felt to be Native American and living on an Indian reservation in the middle of our country. And in this letter, I said to them, it feels like our Native communities are this old grandmother who has a very large and beautiful home. And years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom violently. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture, they're eating our food, they're having a party inside our house. Now they've since come upstairs and they've unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later. We're tired, we're old, we're weak, we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most, the thing that causes us the most pain is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand and simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. I wrote that and I'm like, that's it. That's what I'm feeling. I started sharing that both with my friends as well as with people in my community. Those in my community, other natives, other Navajo people, they, they would listen to what I was saying. And several of them said to me, you know, I've lived here all my life. It's always been a struggle to articulate how it feels. And you're hitting the nail on the head. I shared it with my non-native friends. And instead of getting defensive, they would come back to me and say, what does it look like to say thank you? How does my family, my community, my city, my church, my state, my nation express gratitude towards the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island? I felt like for the first time we were actually talking about the real problem, which is instead of having a discussion about victim versus oppressor, we were having a conversation about what I would term as this reversal of roles where we have a nation that calls itself incorrectly a nation of immigrants. When the United States refers to itself as a nation of immigrants, it neglects African-Americans who were kidnapped, brought here and enslaved. And it dismisses indigenous peoples who never immigrated to be a part of this, of this nation. And so our country calls itself a nation of immigrants incorrectly. And it acts, it's running around acting like they own the place. Meanwhile, we have about 6 million indigenous peoples who have been pushed aside to the borders, to the margins, to these reservations, out of sight and out of mind. And we're being treated like unwanted guests in someone else's house. And a big part of my work, a huge piece of the dialogue I'm trying to initiate is how do we reverse these roles? How do we get our nation to understand in some very real and practical ways you are guests in someone else's house. And how do we talk to indigenous peoples and help our people to understand that in some very real and practical ways, we are the host people of the land. And what do we need to do to step into our role as the hosts? That's, that 
metaphor, that analogy that I gave, this was back in 2004, 2005, has really, that really was the first time I adequately articulated both how I felt, but also in a way that drew people into the conversation. I've actually shared that, that story around the world between indigenous and their colonizers, indigenous peoples and their colonizers and communities all around the world. And I've seen it begin a, a healthy dialogue. And it's one of the most effective tools I've been able to use even here in the US to engage a, a, a healthy dialogue between Western European immigrants and people of color, especially native peoples here in the United States. So that's a little bit of my background and of my story. And what I'm trying to do now is I'm working very hard to create what George Erasmus, who's a Diné leader from the, the um, Diné tribe up in Canada. And when he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there, he used this quote when he said, um, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build a community, he said, you have to start by creating common memory. I love that quote. I think it's genius because I think it gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, which is we don't have a common memory. We have a white majority that remembers a mythological history of discovery and expansion, opportunity and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color, BIPOC and other marginalized communities that have the lived experience of stolen lands and broken treaties, of slavery and Jim Crow laws, of boarding schools and Indian massacres, of internment camps and segregation and mass incarceration, families being ripped apart at our borders, and there's no common memory. And if you look back throughout our entire history, there's no point where you can point to and look at and say, we had healthy community across racial lines. It doesn't exist. And so, so much of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to teach this common memory to teach this history, not to place guilt, not to overly shame people, but to help our nation acknowledge what we've been built on so that we can find a way to, to move forward into a healthier community. Well, thank you, that, that was great. Uh, one, um, I wanna ask you in just a moment about uh, boarding schools and residential schools, cause that uh, was actually a topic that was on my list and I've seen it come up in a couple of, uh, a of places in the chat. And I, um, I think that that in some ways is really emblematic of the, uh, yeah, the, the confusion of the gospel with Western European um, American culture. So I want to ask you about that in a minute, but you said something just a second ago, which reminded me, you, you don't use the term racial reconciliation, you use the term conciliation. And um, I wanted to, I guess, just give you a minute to talk about that really briefly, because I think that's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing for us to hear as well. Yeah, there's a, a native author, his name is Stephen Newcomb, and he wrote a book on the Doctrine of Discoveries called Pagans in the Promised Land. He's done a lot of work to bring this topic to the national level, um, both uh, in our country as well as even um, in the church. He's not a Christian, but he's tried to engage with the Vatican and, and the popes to get this history to be acknowledged. I highly recommend his book. It's called Pagans in the Promised Land. Steve and I don't agree on everything, but his voice is very important in this dialogue. And I was in several meetings with him. I remember especially one meeting we had um, where we were in Pennsylvania at a Quaker um, uh, house of worship. In, in Pennsylvania, and this was just before Pope Francis came and there was discussion, it was actually a meeting to talk about his visit to the United States. And I'd heard him say this before, but he brought it up again at that meeting, which is that using the word reconciliation is not the proper term to use because reconciliation implies that there was a previous harmony, which is very accurate. I, 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 was, a, I was very, it, it really hit me that he was absolutely right. And as I kept thinking about that process, where I'm like, so then what do we do? Because right, we all have used the term racial reconciliation. But if you look at our nation's history with race and understand race, how race was constructed. So there's no genetic definition of race. Race is a human construct. And in the United States, it was constructed to oppress and divide the black race 
was constructed in part through what's called the one drop rule. The one drop rule states that if you have a single drop of African blood, you're black. The reason we have this rule is because blacks were the labor force and our nation wanted to multiply their numbers. The one drop rule allowed a white slave owner to rape his female enslaved people and produce more babies that they could enslave. So they constructed the black race using this one drop rule. The American Indian race was constructed in part through what's called the blood quantum rule. The blood quantum rule states that depending on who you marry, your full, your half, your quarter, your eighth, your 16th, eventually you're bred out of existence. Why? Well, our history, our mythological history states that these lands were discovered, there was nobody here. Our country has treaty obligations to native peoples. They want our numbers as small as possible. And so the American Indian race was constructed to breed us out of existence. And so race is a human construct. And as Steve points out, reconciliation, racial reconciliation is a misnomer. It doesn't, it doesn't describe what was done here. And so as I thought more about that, I, I looked at the root of racial reconciliation. I looked at the root conciliation and conciliation is merely to mediate a dispute. So if reconciliation implies this mythological history that we used to be great, now we're not, we had this harmony, now we don't. Racial conciliation is a much more, demands a much more honest starting point. This thing began as a mess and we're really now for the first time continuing to try to make it better. They can both lead to a healthier relationship. It's just one allows the mythological history to be perpetuated and the other demands a more healthy starting point. So one of my, my primary um, objectives, and I actually started using this even before I ran my, my presidential campaign, but this was also one of the key planks of my platform in my campaign, is I said the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. Conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. But I would not call ours truth and reconciliation because that implies there was a previous harmony. I would use the term truth and conciliation. I've learned how important words are. And so I don't use the term racial reconciliation anymore. I use the term racial conciliation and I call what we need a truth and conciliation commission. And I found that as I use those words, it actually brings people into the dialogue in a much more solemn point understanding this thing began in brokenness and we're just trying to make it better. We're not trying to reclaim a mythological history that never existed. So we're going to, we're going to come back to the, um, the presidential campaign in a few minutes too, because I'd like to, to hear more about that. Um, but would you mind taking a few minutes just to talk about, um, you know, the history of boarding schools and residential schools? And there's, um, there's a quote in particular that uh, I, I've heard it in a number of your previous interviews and, and perhaps it's even in the book, but um, I don't wanna say it, I wanna let you share it. Um, and I can't remember if it's the person who created like the, the very concept of the boarding school, but um, when you hear it, it's, it's very arresting. Um, but would you talk just a little bit about that sort of period in American history? Um, and yeah, I guess then we'll just go from there. Yeah, so one of the things that we have to recognize before we can even get to understand the boarding school, and this is what we were talking about today, um, you know, which is we have this very genocidal history. And it's really, we don't like to acknowledge how blatant we were as a country. And so the, the article I read at the end, which I put in the chat, the link to that article, um, it talks about how one of our most genocidal presidents was actually Abraham Lincoln, who we call our greatest president. And in our book, I argue that that's probably one of the reasons he is our greatest president, because he found a way to constitutionalize, constitutionally protect slavery and to institutionalize white supremacy. Um, and when you read his writings, you look at his history, you look at his policies, he was a blatant white supremacist who actively committed genocide in our nation. Um, in 1851, there was uh, the governor, the first governor of, of California, Peter Burnett, and uh, he was giving his state of the state address, and in his address, he used this quote, 
He said that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate the result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or the wisdom of man to avert. He's not saying famine's broken out and we can't feed these people so they're dying. And he's not saying disease has spread and we can't stop it and they're dying. He's literally saying we can't stop killing these people until they become extinct. Right? This is, this is if you look even at the whole discussion we had in the presentation on promised lands, and you look at Joshua 10, verse 40. And in Joshua 10, verse 40, it says, So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills and the western slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. So because we had claimed this notion of promised land, because we now felt justified without remorse to commit genocide, that's literally what our nation was doing. Now, in 18, um, in uh, the late 1800s, we had, uh, 1890, I think it was, we had the massacre at Wounded Knee, which is one of the most famous massacres in our nation's history of Native people. 350 Dakota men, women, and children were slaughtered in a single day. And our Congress awarded 20 Congressional Medals of Honor for that massacre to U.S. soldiers. And three of those medals were given specifically. So at Wounded Knee, there was a, a ravine or a small canyon at Wounded Knee. And the U.S. Army had three what are called Hotchkiss cannons. They're these, these very powerful cannons. They shoot multiple rounds a minute. They're accurate up to a few hundred yards. And they had three of those cannons there. And when the fighting broke out, they began raining these cannons down on the, the Dakota people. And many of the people ran into this ravine to seek shelter from these guns that were up above. And three of the Congressional Medals of Honor were given specifically to soldiers who went into the ravine and flushed the Dakota people out of them so they could be mowed down by these guns. And in total, we, in total, we gave 20 Congressional Medals of Honor for that massacre. Two years later, um, uh, Richard Pratt, who was an army captain, he was giving a speech on the, the justifying the creation of what they called um, boarding schools where children were taken from their homes, native children, they were put into these military-style boarding schools, punished for speaking their language, punished for practicing their culture. Again, the stories I've heard of the abuse that happened in these boarding schools is gut-wrenching from the survivors. Um, the last of them didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. In fact, the school I went to, Rehoboth Christian School, which was run by the Christian Reformed Church, began as a boarding school and operated as a boarding school until the 1970s and 80s. The years I was there, I was born in 1970, I graduated in 1989, it was transitioning from a boarding school to a day school. So I was there as a day school student, I had other friends who were there as a boarding school student, and sometimes our stories are vastly different of our experience in that school. And so, Richard Pratt was seeking to justify boarding schools. And I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but basically what he said is that um, the goal is we want to kill the Indian and save the man. Um, he referenced a, a previous quote where they said that, you know, the best Indian is the, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And he says, well, we don't believe in that anymore. We're trying to kill the Indian to save the man. And he was, this was two years after Wounded Knee. This, the country was beginning to lose its stomach for outright genocide. And it was instead of trying to kill all natives, it was now seeking to forcibly assimilate us to kill the Indian to save the man. Now, as he was justifying this thinking, he immediately in his speech that he gave in 1892, turned to the history of slavery. And he said, as abhorrent as slavery was, it bestowed upon the African one of the greatest blessings they've ever received. 
which is it brought them from savagery and cannibalism in Africa to civilization and becoming English speaking here in America. And how did we accomplish this and so quickly? Through the process of association, by allowing them to associate with members of the higher race, they became English speaking and civilized. So this is the thinking and it helps us understand the challenges we're facing as a country, right? A lot of us, we talk about how nation, our nation struggles with racism. So one of the definitions of racism is an intentionally harmful or hurtful act against someone specifically because of the color of their skin or their race. We tend to think that our nation has a lot of racists, and then we have a smaller subset of people who are white supremacists. We reserve white supremacists. These are our KKK members. These are our Breitbart, Breitbart editors. These are, you know, the people, these are the, the, the KKK members that we, we think of. But when you understand what white supremacy is, you know, one of the quotes I didn't read about Abraham Lincoln is in his, um, in his first address, or in, during his speeches at the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he was introducing himself to the nation, or to Illinois, in his debates with, with Judge Stephen Douglas. And in that debate, it was known about him that he was against slavery, um, against chattel slavery. But people, that and that was a problem because the entire country was white supremacists. And so when he was introducing himself, he said, I, I have no intention um, of freeing the slaves in states where slavery already exists. He says, I had no intention of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor allowing them to hold office, nor to intermarry. He said, there's a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two from living in terms of social and political equality. But as long as they have to remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, believe that the superior position belongs to the white race. He was a blatant white supremacist. And he and Judge Douglas actually both believed in the lie of white supremacy. They both, if you read their debates, they both got laughed from the audience when they suggested that white and black people were equal. And they both got cheers from the audiences when they, they pointed out how black people were inferior. They both absolutely believed in the lie of white supremacy. They disagreed on slavery. Abraham Lincoln believed that we could, we could keep white supremacy intact even without chattel slavery. And D Judge Douglas was convinced we needed chattel slavery in order to keep white supremacy intact. That's where they disagreed, but they both agreed on white supremacy. The nation believed that both the North and the South were white supremacists. We have a three-fifths compromise, not because of the South, but because of the North. The South wanted to count Blacks as a whole people for representation because they had more Black people. It was the North who said, we want to count them as less because they had less Black people and they didn't want to give the South the advantage. Both sides were white supremacists. One was racist, the other wasn't as racist. And so when you look at, at our history, we, you know, we don't have a small subset of, race, of, of white supremacists and a larger group of racists. The general belief is in the lie of white supremacy. And outside of that belief, there's a small subset of people who are actually proactively racist. And so when we look at the justification for boarding school, right? This helps us understand why assimilation is such a, a core value for Americans. Because when you're white supremacist, one of the greatest gifts that you can give to the subhumans around you is to allow them to associate with you and even to assimilate to your language, your culture, and your worldview. And this is apparent even in the way we do missions. How many of our missionaries around the globe get their foot in the door by doing what? Teaching English, 
starting up micro capitalistic economies, doing micro loan systems, right? We're not going, we're not sending our missionaries out first and foremost to bring the gospel to other people. We send our missionaries out to humanize the subhuman because of the benevolence we have based on our belief in the lie of white supremacy. And so I would actually argue that the majority of the nation believes at some level in this lie of white supremacy. And we have a smaller subset of people who are proactively racist because of it. And so this, you know, one, one of the things I, I said earlier, I don't use the term racial reconciliation. The other term I don't use is white privilege. White privilege makes it sound like what white people have is a blessing that they just need to learn how to share. That's not accurate. As I point out numerous times when I speak, if you build a nation by claiming to have discovered it, and then you ethnically cleanse the land and commit genocide against people who live there, and then you import millions of people from another continent who are black and enslave them and force them to build up this continent, this country, guess what's gonna happen? You are going to become unbelievably wealthy. You will be unbelievably powerful. Has nothing to do with God's blessing or with your privilege. This is really the fruits of oppression. This is the fruits of genocide. This is the fruits of ethnic cleansing. This is the fruit of enslavement. So I don't use the term white privilege because that again adheres, that, that appeals to the sense of, of white people are just blessed and they have to learn how to share it. I call it what it is. This is white supremacy. It's a racial, it's, it's a racial injustice and we need to confront it. One of the things I, I talk about, I, we have two chapters in the book that go into depth on trauma. I won't go into all of that right now, but one of the things I point out is one of the most unifying themes in American politics is the theme of American exceptionalism. In the book, we identify, I, I identify American exceptionalism as the coping mechanism for a nation that's in deep denial of its genocidal past as well as its current racist reality. Right, this is why our infrastructure is crumbling, our Medicare system, our, our medical system doesn't give equal treatment, our, our, our educational system is subpar at best, and yet we hold to this belief with everything we have that somehow we are still exceptional. Why? Because if we're not exceptional, if we're not somehow favored by God, and given certain rights and privileges above everybody else, if we're not somehow better than other people and live by a different set of rules, then guess what? We are just another colonial nation living off the fruits of genocide. And that thought is unfathomable for most people. And so we cling to this narrative of American exceptionalism because it's our coping mechanism. So we don't have to deal with our actual reality and the actual history that we're standing on. Um, what you just brought up actually made me think of another uh, another topic that you've talked about in a, another setting that I wanted to give you a moment to talk about too. You mentioned trauma, and I think that this really ties into the idea of white privilege too. Um, but you've spoken before about the idea of um, I want to say it's uh, perpetrator or perpetration induced traumatic uh, trauma syndrome or something like that. Um, it's it's kind of it's almost like the reverse of, of um, you know, what we talk about often is PTSD, but the idea, which I think is important for us from a spiritual perspective of um, when we have been the perpetrator of injustice, we suffer as well in a different way, but, but we suffer as well. And I want to just give you a minute to talk about that. Yeah, there's one of the things I talk about um, when we, when you look at trauma and most of our, most people understand PTSD right, which is post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's an individual diagnosis for someone who has experienced a horrifying event. It affects you mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically. It's kind of this all-encompassing condition, but it's an individual diagnosis for someone who's experienced a single horrifying event. Now, there's another type of PTSD called complex PTSD. Complex PTSD doesn't come from a single event, it comes from a series of events. 
So if you can get PTSD from being assaulted, you can get complex PTSD from living in an abusive relationship. If you can get PTSD from um, experiencing a battle, you can get complex PTSD from living in a war zone. And it's been observed by psychologists that complex PTSD can be passed down from one generation to the next. They can see the symptoms in the children and grandchildren of people who experience the complex PTSD. They're not quite sure how it gets there, but they, they, they observe it, they see it in multi-generations, multiple generations. Um, now there's another trauma that's called historical trauma. Historical trauma is how psychologists understand the dissatisfaction that exists in an entire community. Um, they observed it first in Native American communities after the boarding schools and in their removal. Um, they also, you can observe it in African American communities after segregation, after mass incarceration, after enslavement. You can see it in Japanese American communities after internment camps. You can see it in Jewish communities after the Holocaust. Um, I refer to historical trauma as the multi generational. Um, so the difference between historical trauma and PTSD or complex PTSD is that it affects the entire community. And so I refer to historical trauma as the multi-generational and communal manifestation of a complex PTSD. Does that make sense for everybody? Now, there's a, another trauma that's been diagnosed out there. And Rachel McNair wrote a book on it in 2012, and it's called PITS, P-I-T-S stands for perpetration-induced traumatic stress. And she identifies that PITS is like PTSD in almost every way, shape, and form, except if PTSD afflicts the victim of a horrifying event, PITS afflicts the perpetrator, the person who caused it. And so when I first started lecturing on the doctrine of discovery, after each lecture, um, A, I had a hard time keeping my white audience engaged throughout the entire lecture. It was very difficult. And I actually observed that about one half of 1% of my audience would be so bothered by my lecture that they would stand up in the middle of a, my lecture and confront me as a liar. They would become so bothered by what I was saying. That didn't happen all the time. It was one half of 1%. So um, it didn't happen every time, but it happened on multiple occasions. And after every lecture, I would have two lines in front of me asking questions. One was a line of people of color. And they were almost giddy. They were excited because they knew this history was so horrible. But they didn't know all the dates. They didn't know all the policies. They didn't have all the pieces in line like I put them out there. And so they were excited. Of like, yeah, this is this. I see this. And now, you know, you're helping me prove what I always knew existed there. And then I have a line of white people. And they, they would be standing there much more solemn and their faces were like a sheep. And they would come up to me with this almost blank stare in their eyes and, and they would say, I had no idea the history was that horrible. And then the first thing they would say is, tell me how to fix it. And I recognized that, that look. I recognized what was happening to them from some trauma I had been through in my own life. I go into it more in depth in the book. And, but, but I was experiencing, well, but I wasn't sure what to call it. And I wanted to look at, and I was seeing in so many people that I knew it wasn't, it wasn't an individual diagnosis. And I, I was trying to, is this something like historical trauma, but for the people who caused the trauma. And I even talked to some of my, some, some friends of mine who work in the, in the field of psychology, some colleagues I've had, and we discussed it and they agreed with me, you're observing some kind of trauma, but it, it's not like historical trauma. And I didn't have the language to articulate it. And then I found the research by Rachel McNair on pits. And once I had her research on pits, I could now theorize that if PTSD have a multi-generational and communal manifestation at a complex level that we call historical trauma, it would make sense that the pits would also have a multi-generational and communal manifestation at a complex level that I was observing was afflicting white Americans. And so I began to interact with and understand that white America is another group of traumatized people. And so I've gone 
into my interactions with white people, understanding that they are dealing with traumas. Now, the difference is white people are not victims of trauma. Again, this is a perpetration induced traumatic stress. It comes from what they're standing on and from even from the, 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 the things they've received from that trauma or from the, the, that injustice. But what I found this to actually be one of the most effective tools I've developed to help me keep white people from derailing my work. Because whenever, like, as I did this research, you know, understanding the historical trauma of communities of color was very helpful when I would go to teach to African American communities or to Native communities to understand the trauma that they had been through, helped me prepare my lectures in advance so I, I would know what would be triggering for them and how I could adjust it or make sure that they could hear it well. Understanding that white people were also traumatized by the history that they were standing on as the perpetrators of it, it allowed me to actually prepare for them better and to, to keep them from derailing the work that I was trying to do and knocking it off for. I go into this in much more depth in my book, um, but it's, it's really one of the more effective tools I've been able to use to understand what's going on on both sides. Um, and I found it to be one of the most, uh, one of the most helpful things I've been able to use. And actually this morning I've been reading, we're, <laughs> we've been reading with our kids the story of um, The Hiding Place. And uh, my, my children really liked that book. And we decided to read Corey Ten Boom's next book. It's called Tramp for the Lord. And it's stories about how she goes around the world kind of speaking and, and sharing about her experience in the, in the uh, concentration camps. And in both books, she shares a story about her sister, Betsy. And Betsy died in the concentration camp. And uh, they were from Holland, they're from the Netherlands, and they were in this concentration camp for hiding the Jews. And Betsy actually died there. And, and before she died, her and Corey were talking. And Corey, or Betsy said to Corey, she said, after the war, we are gonna have to come back to Germany to minister to these German people who are committing these atrocities. And Corey was shocked. What do you mean? They're, look how cruel these are. And she said, yeah, I remember the guard today, this." 17 year old girl who was whipping one of the prisoners in the camp and, and shouting obscenities at her and screaming at her. Think of all that hatred she feels. How could that not affect her long term? And she said, the German people are going to be in need of so much love and healing from God. And it, it really struck me that that's actually some of the same vision that God's given me of what we need to do of in, in this nation is. We need to understand that, again, it's not that white Americans are victims of trauma, but because of the history our nation is standing on and the fact that our nation has never dealt with it, there is a level of healing that needs to happen within white America that's never happened before. One of the best compliments I've ever gotten from one of my lectures was someone, I forget if this was in a, an email they sent me or something I saw online. And they were sharing about one of my lectures on the Doctrine of Discovery. And they were encouraged, as a white person, they were encouraging others to go to it. And they said, go to this lecture, listen to Mark Charles talk about these things. It's one of the hardest lectures you're ever going to hear. But you will end up feeling more human than you've ever felt before at the end of it. And I thought that was a really kind of insightful way to phrase it. Um, because I think there is. There's, you know, we talk about the dehumanizing history of what this has done and how it's created subhumans out of, out of people of color. Well, it's also dehumanized white people because it's put white people in a position that is not sustainable at a human level, right? What white people have, what they live on is not sustainable. When we look at, when we look at the injustice, if we have people of color down here and white people up here, we often think the goal is to bring everybody up here. Well, that's not true. To live up here requires the oppression of people down here, right? America does not have the wealth it has today if it doesn't have a history of genocide and ethnic cleansing and enslavement. It just doesn't, right? The 1% cannot live the way they live without the oppression of people from the margins and people beneath it. Living up here is not sustainable. So one of the things we have to do is we obviously have to lift up people who are at the bottom and bring them up. But we also 
have to absolutely lower white people. One of the things that I've talked about in my campaign as well as in my work is I am trying to decenter whiteness. I'm not trying to oppress white people. I'm not trying to flip the tables and give them a taste of their own medicine, but I am absolutely trying to decenter them and bring them down to a level where we can actually understand we're all human at the same level. That's gonna feel oppressive. If you're used to living up here and living off the fruit of oppression of people down beneath, being treated merely as human is gonna feel oppressive even though it's not. But this is the goal, is up here is not sustainable. If our goal is just to get everyone to where white people live today, we can't sustain that. So we have to lift up those from the, the bottom, but we also have to lower the people who think they are superior because that's not human either. So I want to respect uh, your time and I wanted to wrap this up around an hour. Um, so you know, we'll have a few more minutes, um, but we'll, we'll start trying to land the plane, as they say. Um, so uh, to wrap things up, um, what, and maybe you can, as you do this, uh, kind of tie in a little, you know, a little more about your presidential campaign. Um, first off, I'm sorry you lost. I'm really, <laughs> um, but uh, like, if you could just talk a little more about that. I know there are a couple of questions that are policy related, I think in here about, um, you know, there's one about reparations and, um, and, and just policies and laws in general that, um, that you were hoping to enact. And maybe there was, maybe there was something else, you know, maybe even a deeper thing that you were trying to do with that as well, um, even beyond just policies and laws. But I'd love to just hear you talk a little more about, um, about that, about why you ran, about what you were um, wanting to, to do with that. And then also, you know, maybe we can wrap up just a little talking about uh, where we go from here. And as Christians, what is what is the way forward? Um, and and as I say that, I want to be really clear to avoid the uh, the which is I think a, a notorious thing that white people do because we um, are, are so used to having power um, is is assuming that we can fix everything with just a few. Uh, policies, laws, whatever, um, it's going to take a lot more work than that. But what um, what is the way forward in your eyes for the church, for us as individual Christians? How can we um, begin to heal and, and begin to embark on a, a journey of conciliation? Yeah. So let me start just by talking briefly about, um, about my campaign. So it was probably almost 15 years ago, maybe even close to 20 years ago, 15 to 20, 20 years ago, that the, the thought of running for president first kind of crossed my mind. And it was actually the, the day that we were engaging in what was called, um, oh, it was the start of the Iraq war back in like 2003. And I forget what we called it right now. It was, it was um, I forget what we called it, but it was the day we were bombing the crap out of Iraq, out of Baghdad. And um, I was, I remember I was praying that day. And one of the things that I felt most strongly was I had this feeling like America just continues making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. And we never learn from them. You know, in the book, one of the things that we, we highlight in the book is one of the challenges America faces is we've never lost a war that matters. We've never given up land. We've never been invaded. We've never had a had a regime change. We've never we've never been disarmed. And because the winners write the history, we've been able to write our own history as a nation for 250 years as a nation. But as a, as this continent, the white Americans on the, our white people on this continent, they've been able to write their own history for two, for 500 years. And so because of that, we now have this mythological history that is almost nowhere even close to being rooted in reality. And that was the first time I began thinking, I should, I want to think about running for president. And I kind of began pondering that a little bit more and, and, and thinking more concretely about that. Um, can we address it from that level? Um, but uh one of the reasons that I that brought me to to actually 
declare my campaign for presidency. Um, and there's a lot of steps along the way, but it was in 2016 or two, yeah, 2016, I was listening to President Obama give his final state of the union address. And in his address, he was lamenting and even talking about the divisiveness that had occurred um, in his presidency and uh, the part of the deep partisanship that he had experienced. Um, and he was calling our nation to a new politics. And in his speech, he said, um, he said, we the people, our constitution begins with these three simple words, words that we've come to recognize mean all the people. And I heard him say that, and I was like, when? When did we decide we the people meant all the people? I had looked at our history. The founding fathers didn't believe it. Abraham Lincoln didn't believe it. The civil rights movement didn't get us there. When did we decide that we the people meant all the people? And I decided I wanted to call the question. I was done debating the humanity of people of color. I was done trying to convince people that we're human. I was done having that debate. I wanted to say, do we want to be a nation where we the people actually means all the people? If we do, then we got to work on our foundations. And if we don't, then elect whoever you want. It's not going to matter because no one's going to fix the problem. And that's what really convinced me to start running for president is I wanted to address these things at a foundational level. And I was convinced that the best way to bring these conversations to the forefront was through a presidential campaign. I had actually watched, um, I had actually watched uh, uh, Bernie Sanders very closely during the 2016 campaign. And one of the things that um, I admired about him is that he was adamant about bringing a dialogue to the table about systemic economic inequality. But I also concluded that he ran a protest campaign, right? In, in 2016, everyone who knew anything about politics knew that year was Hillary's year. She had sat out the 2012 election, uh, so President Obama could run on, on opposed everyone knew that 2016 was her year. And Bernie Sanders was an independent from Vermont as a senator. And he, he everyone knew he wasn't going to get nominated, but he ran because he wanted to bring a, a dialogue to the forefront, which was our systemic economic inequality. He got more traction than he expected, I think, from millennials. And by the time he realized he had a chance, he was now stuck running in a primary that was never going to nominate him. And so, even though he was popular, he raised a lot of money, he, was, he did it in a way that almost ensured he was never going to get nominated. And I didn't want to run a protest campaign. I knew my campaign would be a long shot, but when I ran, I actually wanted to run in a way that would give me a path to the White House. And so I decided not to run as a Democrat or to run as a Republican, but to run as an independent so that I actually could be, it'd be a long shot path, but there was actually a chance of getting all the way to the White House. And uh, so that's what we did. And that also allowed me in my, in early in my campaign, living on the reservation the, for the 11 years before that, one of the things I, I observed most clearly was that it really bothered me that you could become president of the United States without ever campaigning to native peoples. The Navajo reservation is 36,000 square miles or 26,000 square miles. If we were a state, we'd be the 40th largest state. We have, 200,000 members on the reservation, 300,000 enrolled tribal members around the country. Um, and yet we don't get campaigned to because we don't have any impact really on the electoral college. Um, and so it bothered me that you could become president without ever campaigning to native peoples. And so because I ran as an independent, it wasn't tied to go to Iowa or New Hampshire first, I actually began my campaign by campaigning for almost all of 2019 to the native peoples of Turtle Island. I went to New Mexico, I went to Arizona, I went to Colorado, I went to South Dakota, I went to Wisconsin, I went to Minnesota, I went to Oregon, I went to California, I went to Oklahoma. I campaigned on native reservations and native communities all around the country first and foremost, because I felt like that was the most respectful way to begin the campaign. 
So yeah, there was a lot of things and I absolutely believed and I'm convinced even to this day that we had the best vision of any campaign out there. Our vision was to build a nation where we the people truly means all the people. Our vision was to remove the racism, the sexism and the white supremacy from our foundations. After the lynching of George Floyd, right? Joe Biden suggested that we train officers to shoot people in the kneecaps. President Obama signed an executive order saying that we should, we are President Trump, I'm sorry, signed an executive order saying that we needed to ban certain chokeholds. I was the only candidate that was out there boldly saying we have to abolish slavery. The 13th Amendment keeps slavery legal in our prison system. This is the prison system that just, the criminal justice system that just lynched George Floyd. We have to remove that systemic racism and white supremacy by first and foremost abolishing slavery. But no one wanted to talk about that, even the media. So then a few weeks, a few months, a month or two later, we had the shooting of George Floyd, right? Or not George Floyd, of Jacob Blake. Well, according to both Trump and Biden, that shouldn't have been a problem, right? He was neither choked nor was he shot lethally. Still, there were massive protests. Why? because it was absolutely unjust. It was wrong, but they weren't dealing with the systemic problems. And so these were the things that we wanted to address as a campaign. And I'm, I'm still convinced to this day that we had the best vision going throughout that entire campaign. And so it's something I, I was, I'm very glad we did it. We, we built a lot of momentum, got a lot of energy going. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of options. I'm still pretty young. I just turned 50 a week ago. So um, in this field, I'm still a young person. So we'll see what we can do coming up next. But those are some of the things going into that campaign. Um, in regards to the second half of your question was what, again? Was what is the way forward for, yeah. for the church and for, for us, I guess, as individual Christians? So when Sun Chan and I were started writing this book, the book began, On Selling Truth, began as a call to lament, an invitation for the church to acknowledge its history, acknowledge its complicity in this history, and to lament it. Sun Chan had just finished a book um, previously called A Prophetic Lament. I was traveling the country, inviting the church into a season of lament, and our our first thesis of the book was to invite the church to lament its history. After the 2016 election and the oversized role the church played in helping elect Donald Trump, Sung Chan and I met and we decided to redraft our thesis. And we realized that our book needed to become um, a flat out rebuke. We just had to rebuke the church not just the Republicans, but the church in general for what it was doing and for the role it was playing. And so the, the book took on a much more sharper tone. It still talked the same history, but we, we reframed it and ordered things in a different way so that the book ended as a flat out both critique and rebuke of the church. And I wanna read for you a passage that I wrote. And this we were gonna end the book with this passage. Um, it's not very long. But uh, we decided to, to use the story we have instead in the book. But I want to read this to you because I think that it will actually help you understand some of our thinking and what the role is that the church needs to do. And basically what we said is the church, because it has bought into this lie of, um, it's bought into this lie of, uh, hold on, I'm bringing up this passage, because it's bought into the lie of Christendom and creating a Christian empire, the church is now impotent because it thinks the solution to the problem is actually what caused it in the first place, which is just to make the nation Christian. And so before the church can be effective in confronting the injustices that it's complicit in, the church has to abandon the heresy of Christian empire or of Christendom. I do a lot of consulting with the, the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship at Calvin University and Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids. And in 2018, I think it was, um, they asked me to write a passage 
um, on my prophetic message and put it in the form of a proverb. And in 2018, our nation was really wrestling with immigration and especially with the, the challenge of children being kept in cages and families being ripped apart at our borders. And I wrote this um, at for that for a conference I was speaking at there. And I want to read it for you here because it really it gives you what I think is what we need to do next as a church. Wise is the church that refuses to buy into the trappings of partisan politics. Remember, my brothers and sisters, Jesus did not come to create a Christian empire. He came to make disciples. He came to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He came to plant a church. When the church merely lobbies one political leader and protests the other, when for the sake of argument or political gain, the body of Christ turns a blind eye to one sin and magnifies another, we are not representing the headship of our body who is Christ. As vile, repulsive, and urgent is the Trump administration's separation of families at our borders, it's not the first time. Indian removal, the slave trade, boarding schools, lynchings, Japanese internment camps, mass incarceration, even the deportation numbers of the Obama administration. The list of ways the US government has worked to destroy the family structure of people of color throughout our history is as long as it is depressing. So let's stop pretending that President Trump is a God-ordained savior or the ultimate demise of our union. The same with President Obama. What our nation needs is not for Democrats to be better Democrats, nor do we need Republicans to simply be better Republicans. We don't even need our nation to be more Christian. My brothers and sisters, the United States of America is not, never has been, nor will it ever be Christian. Jesus did not come to create a Christian empire. He came to make disciples. He came to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He came to plant a church. And wise is a church that refuses to buy into the trappings of partisan politics. I agree with Kenneth Kaunda, the former president of Zambia, who said, what a nation needs more than anything else is not a Christian ruler in the palace, but a Christian prophet within earshot. I'll put the link for that into the chat. I'll also put the link. There's one other um, passage that we we didn't get to talk about today, but one of the things I've I've lectured on and I've spoken on a lot is the difference between power versus authority, and it really gets to the heart of understanding the difference between worldly power and biblical authority is at the heart of what we need to do to I think enact the systemic change that needs to be made without becoming what it is we're fighting against. So I'm going to um, give a link to um, a sermon that I preached. Um, at, this is at the uh, Urban Youth Workers Conference in California in 2017. It's just titled The Biblical Dynamics of Power and Authority. And I'm putting a link to that in the chat. And I'll also put a link in there to that other passage I just read from Prophecy to Proverb, which is um, also on my website. Um, and so you're welcome to go there and to uh, read that as well. There's a lot of resources on my website as well as on my social media. I'm fairly active. Um, I just put that there too. And so, yeah, there's a lot of resources out there that you can use. And I'll put one last link on here if you're interested in this. On my website, you, our book is for sale anywhere you want to get it. Um, it's done fairly well. There also is a space on our website if you want to buy a signed copy of our book. Um, I'll, you can get it from our website. And I just put a link for that there now too. So there's a few more links in the chat of resources that you want. But uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun. I'm really glad we had a chance to chat like this for a few minutes.